good morning. First, I would like to say that it is a true blessing and a privilege. And as I'm seeing a divine appointment that brings me here. I am a mother and a wife. A few things I'm still working on. <laughs> I am an actress and a new film producer. But my most important I am is that I'm a child of the Most High God. And without him, I have nothing. Without him, I am nothing. And if he's not in it, I don't want anything to do with that. Indeed, thank you, Lord. Now, his presence is thick up in this place. My prayer is that he would fill every space, every crack, every crevice leaving no space untouched by his Holy Spirit. And I feel him here. I feel that he has done just that. And the worship, sweet, anointed, powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Now, many times when I speak, I give my war room testimony. I'm not going to do that today because I've got a message that I want to share that I believe will be encouraging, especially for a time such as right now where we find ourselves sisters and brothers, my sons and my daughters. After War Room, everybody reached out to me from the entertainment sector wanting me to play a like character, their version of Miss Clara. And I'm telling you, I was grateful for the opportunity that God would give me to take the message of prayer around the world. Someone who had been the number one party girl on the planet. <laughs> That's indeed go God. Because you see, when he first has a thought of you, when you first pass through his spirit, he sees you in a certain way. And he knew from the foundations that he had laid a plan for me when Jesus would come to this planet that he would walk and carry a cross so that I would be saved and in position when the time came for this sinner saved by grace to pick up the mantle and share the message of prayer. God is not a respecter of people, people. What he's done for me, he will do for you. All you have to do is get out of his way and let him use you. So anyway, after War Room, everybody was reaching out to me, wanting me to play their version of Miss Clara. And I said, God, I'm grateful, but you know, I'm a classically trained actress. You've given me so much to, 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 to work with. God, help me. And then after many hours of prayer, he gave me a story called Discarded Things. Some of you may have seen it. For those who haven't, uh, there's a copy out there. He led me to write my own piece. And at the same time, he connected me to a billionaire uh, who was and still is a fan of mine who promised to give me money to make the movie, but when it came time, he backed out. And I was like, again, oh God, I, I, if you want me to do it, you're gonna have to make a way. <laughs> and that is what he did. He made a way. And he used Miss Clara to do it. I was able to travel the country offering a program I put together, an evening with Miss Clara. And I was able to raise the funds to shoot the movie. And then a fan of mine reached out to me knew, knew, knowing that I was doing the fundraisers. And she invited me to come up to this area. She had reached out to other churches where I could go and do this Miss Clara thing. And again, that's Tracy. 
So when it came time to shoot, all of our meals were provided by Chick-fil-A. I didn't have to pay for one hotel room for any of my talent coming from Los Angeles or Atlanta or anywhere else around this country because people stepped up and opened their doors to allow my talent to stay there for free. God provided everything that I needed. And so again, I say what he's done for one, he will do for others. We just need to be in alignment and in his will to watch and see what he does. But there was a song out at the time I was raising funds and making petition to God. And perhaps some of you heard this song before. It's called Do It Again by Elevation Worship. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won. For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. He might not come when you want him to come. But he's always right on time. My message is about holding on to his promises no matter what things look like. And as I look back, I see that he never intended for that billionaire to provide for me because my attention, perhaps some adoration would be going in the wrong direction. He wanted my eyes on daddy, the creator, the giver of the gift, the one who hung the sun, moon and stars, the one who sees the sparrow when it falls, the one who cares about every single detail about So the story I'm going to share with you is a story of promise. And a woman who held on. Oops. To the promise. It comes from 2 Kings 4th chapter. It's a story a lot of people probably haven't heard, but it is powerful. And I pray that it brings you encouragement. There was a woman who lived in the city of Shunem. And in the Hebrew name, I chose to give her this name, Hamana. Hamana in Hebrew, it means belief. It means faith. I named her husband Azrael. Azrael in the Hebrew language means support. So one day, Hamana is with her husband and they walk into the town square and there's a large group formed. She walks over and she gets a peek in. And in the center, she sees him, the man of God. Elisha. And they stand back for a few moments and they listen to his message. And after a few moments, she says to her husband, she says, Surely, surely this, this is a man of God. Let us invite him home. And so that is what they did. And every time he came to Mount Carmel, or anywhere close, she invited him home to her home, and there they would eat and sup together. And over the years, they became very close. So one day she said to her husband, she said, Azrael, let us make for him a room. And let us put in that room a bed 
and the table and the chair and the lamp. And that is what they did. So whenever he came to visit, he could stay there with his servant Gehazi. So the years they passed and it became closer and closer. And the Bible says that one time he was up in this rooftop room where she had made this lovely, lovely, lovely space for him. And he said to his servant Gehazi, call Hamana. She comes up the stairs and she stands before him. And he says to her, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? You have been kind and courteous and patient, so generous. What can I do for you? Can I talk to the king? Can I talk to the head of the army for you? And she said, I, I am blessed. <laughs> I, I have everything that I need. And I am blessed to live among my own. And then she left. But his servant Gehazi walked over to him and said, but Elijah, she has no son. And her husband is old. So he called for her to come back and she stands before him. And he says to her, he says, this time next year, you will be holding in your arms a son. And now, according to the Bible, her response tells me a whole lot. Her response was, man of God, please don't make me promises. Don't get my hopes up. So if that was her response, that is what she had been praying for. That is what she wanted year after year. And every month that the blood flowed, her heart would break because she had not conceived. So time passed. And that same time, the following year, she held in her arms a beautiful, curly head son I gave him the name from Hebrew Hebrew Arles Arles means promise of God so the years they go by and I imagine that every time Elijah came he just enjoyed watching this baby grow up I imagine that he called the child in Hebrew, eched, eched. In Hebrew, it means grandson. And I imagine the child would look up to him and say, Saba, Saba. In Hebrew, Saba is grandfather. So the years, they pass. They grow closer. They grow closer. They are family. They are family. And then one day, According to the Bible, the child was out in the field playing. And he had a great pain in his head. And he ran over to his father who was out working with some of the attendants. And he said, Father, my head, my head, my pain, it, it, I, it, it hurts. Father, help me. And the Bible says that his father, Azrael, called for one of the attendants to take the child to his mother. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know when your child is in pain. You know that they've got several different cries. You know when it's a skinned knee. You know when it's just a bump on the head. But you see, as she heard her child coming closer, she heard a sound that she had never heard coming from him before. That cry she had never heard before. And I imagine that her heart began to race. The Bible says she went to the door. She opened the door. And she took her child. Now, I imagine that she began to rock that child. And she made for him a tea with a tincture that she always gave him when he was in pain. But he didn't stop crying. 
And I imagine that she took him over to the chair. And there she rocked her precious promise from God. And she sang to him the song that she would sing to him when he was growing in her womb. She sang, my beautiful promise from God. My beautiful promise from God. With his grace and his mercy, he is richly blessed. My beautiful promise from God. The Bible said that at 12 o'clock noon, the child's body grew limp. And being a mother, I imagine she looked to see if his stomach was moving. That is what we do. And she put her ear down towards his nose to see if she could feel any oxygen, any air moving. He was not breathing. Her precious promise was seemingly dead. The Bible says that she took her child and she climbed the stairs to that rooftop room she had made for the prophet of God. And I imagine that she climbed the stairs, she sang, my beautiful promise from God, my beautiful promise from God. And then she gets to the door and she opens it wide. And the Bible says she took the child's limp body and she laid it on the bed of the prophet Elijah. And I imagine she backed away, tears streaming. My beautiful promise from God. My beautiful promise from God. With his grace and his mercy, he richly blessed me. With my beautiful promise from God. The Bible says that she called for her husband says that her husband came in. And I imagine that he could tell by her stance, by her, 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 her presence, that something was terribly wrong. And she tells him that the promise from God is dead. I imagine he backed into a chair, could not catch his breath. Because you see, he was an old man who loved his son. This was an answer to prayer for him as well. She tells him, I want you to send me a rider and a donkey. I am going to find the man of God. The Bible says that her husband said, but, but it is not the Sabbath. It is not the new moon. And she says to him, it is well. And then he made all the arrangements that she needed. And her rider who would accompany her got on his donkey. She got on hers. The Bible says she told him, don't, don't you stop un unless you hear me calling for you to stop or slow down. And off they went. Now you can imagine that that donkey she was on. Baby, that donkey had never been ridden like that before. <laughs> this was a mother on a mission, holding on to the promise. No matter what things look like. So mind you, Mount Carmel is where they were heading because that is where the prophet was, the man of God. And it was 25 miles away from the city of Shunem. So off they went. The Bible says that Elijah was there and surrounded by a circle of people doing what he does, healing, praising God, doing the works of the Lord. The Bible said that something in his spirit just, just made him look up. And then from a distance, he could see her coming, riding. And he wondered to himself what could be wrong. Why has God withheld this from me? 
And I find that line interesting because sometimes we think we, we're saved and we've got it all together. We feel like we've arrived and we forget who God is because he's working through us. We think that we're now gone sometimes. So anyway, God withheld this from him and he tells his servant Gehazi, he says, I want you to go and I want you to meet her and I want you to ask her if there's something wrong with her, if there's something wrong with her son, if there's something wrong with her husband. The Bible says he met her and he asked her, is there something wrong with you? Is there something wrong with your son? Is there something wrong with your husband? The Bible says that she bent over and she said to him, it is well. And then she climbed down off of a donkey. And she made her way through that crowd. Shalom, shalom, pardon me. Shalom, 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 shalom. And the Bible says that when she was standing before the prophet, she fell to her knees and she grabbed him by the ankles and said, Did I tell you? Not to get my hopes up. Did I ask you for a son? Now, mind you, time had passed, and Elijah, he loved this boy. He knew by her countenance, by the way she was acting, that this son, something terrible had happened. And again, he's wondering, why would God keep this from him? So what he does then, he calls his servant Gehazi. He tells him to take his, his staff, his anointed staff, and take it to her home, put it on the child. He told him, do not stop to speak to anyone. Don't uh, stop at all. Tuck in your cloak and keep going. But you see what she did. What she did was key. This is what we have to remember when adversity comes, when it looks like it's so dark, you'll never make it out of the darkness. The Bible says she held on, held on to his ankles. And she said, as surely as God does live, and as sorely as you do live, I am not leaving here without you. And I imagine that because he loved her so, he gently lifted her up and he excused himself. And off he went with her to her home. And I can imagine it was a long ride for Elijah. <laughs> Feeling like God has closed him out feeling like maybe God has stepped away from the promises that he had made him. The Bible says when he reached her home, the servant Gehazi came out and he said, the child is still dead. So he climbs down off of his donkey and he walks into the house and he climbs the stairs. Now you know it must have been like climbing Mount Everest with, with, with cement boots. This is his grandson. And then what's happening with God? What's going on here? I was so confident. I was so comfortable doing things the way I was doing him, the way God was working through me. Why throw me this? Clinking well. So he caught, climbs the stairs, and I'm sure the tears are flowing. And he's praying. He's praying, and he opens the door. You see, right now, he didn't know if God was going to answer his prayers. The rug had been pulled out from under him. So he had to lean on God the way he used to lean on God. So he opens the door and there 
there laying on his bed is this beautiful promise, cold and dead. The Bible says then he went back to doing what he knew how to do. The Bible says he began to praise God. Father God, you reign. There is nothing that you can't do. You are the source creator of life. I need you, God, and I know what you can do. You are the Alpha and Omega. And the Bible says, after praising God, he walked over to that bed and he laid over the child, eye to eye, nose to nose, hand to hand. And after a few moments, that child's body began to grow warm. Says so he got back up and he started praising God even more. God, faithful God, El Shaddai, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, source. And the Bible says he went back and he laid across that child, eye to eye, nose to nose, mouth to mouth, hand to hand. And the Bible says after a few moments, that child sneezed seven times. And I imagine that when that child opened his eyes, he saw above him his, his Saba. And he says, Saba, Saba. You know, he's wondering what's going on. He doesn't know he had been dead. And Elijah looks down on this promise from God. And he says, Eket, my Eket. And the Bible says that he called for Hamana. She came up and he put the child in her arms. And the Bible says she fell to her knees to give thanks and then off she went. But see, so many times, we forget about the power in the word that make up the promises of God. I'm talking words that brought life into existence. Let there be life and there was life. Not just ordinary words, powerful words from God that have life in them can resurrect the dead can change any situation, can heal any sickness, can change your finances, your home issues, your marriage. These promises are power packed. Too often we forget. God wants you to taste and see how good he is. He is his word. Taste and see how good it is, how filling it is. All of the nutrients in that word. No matter what things look like, COVID. Crazy political climate. All of the distractions to take you out of alignment. To get your eyes on something else other than the prize. The promise. Daddy to the test. Put him to the test. The Alpha and the Omega. Put him to the test. And see what he does. When I was making that movie, I cried many a day, screamed many a night. But see, he came through the way I needed him to come through. Not through the billionaire. The billionaire is a guy when he was 22 years old. He came up with the idea of timeshare. Sold it at 22. Made several million. And he's gifted from God because that's just the way his mind works. So he is very, 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 very rich. But the fact that Father God pulled him out of the equation. In the 20th hour, you know, 
so close. Everybody had been casted. Everything was ready to go. And then he says, no. But you see what? He, he, my father, the giver of the gift, he showed up. And he showed out. And not only did we get the movie made, but it's doing so well. You know, because I'd been an actress, you know, he skipped me that. But the producing part, I'm like, what? You know, all new to me, but I had to trust him in a way that I'd never trusted him before. The way that the Shunammite woman trusted him. The way that Elijah had to learn to trust him again. And that is what you have to do, my brothers and my sisters, no matter what it is, no matter what it's been like. My mother was an alcoholic and a drug addict. My father, an alcoholic. And so the things I saw growing up were crazy at times. But like I said, from the foundation, when he first thought of me, when I was a stirring in his spirit, he had me set aside to one day play the prayer warrior who would encourage people, all people, around the world people, to come back to prayer. And again, I say, what he's done for me or others, he will do for you. you got to put him to the test. I don't care what it is. Because he raises the dead. That could be dead finances, physically dead human bodies that he's created. Nothing is too difficult for him. All things are possible. Just learn to do what I did. Get out of his way. Put him on the mantle of your heart. I'm going to wind up with this. There was a young girl who held on to promises. She, she wasn't the most beautiful girl. I don't know. It doesn't say anything about it. We don't know exactly how old she was. Debatable. 13, 12. She came from very humble means. You've heard the saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Do you know what Nazareth was? It was the hood. It was the ghetto. If anything was happening bad, it was happening over in Nazareth. But you see, God, who sees everything, he knew that there was a girl there, the perfect girl, whose heart he sat right in the center of. And he sent the angel Gabriel who said, Mary, behold, you have found favor with God, and you have been chosen to bear his only son. And then what Mary did, after a few moments, she was human, so I'm sure a couple of things went through her mind, but she eventually said, well, how can this be? Seeing that I've known no man, and he said that the Holy Spirit will fill you up. And the Holy God will overcover you, will overshadow you. And then she said this, and this is what we all must do. Because some of us, you can quote the Bible backwards. But is that word living in you? Is it making changes? Because if it's in you, it has to change you. Mary's response after the angel told her that the Spirit of God would overshadow her and the Holy Spirit would fill her, she said... Be it unto me according to what you have said. And then when she said that, not only did she believe, but she conceived. And there the Savior to all mankind began to live. And that heart would beat and he would grow. And another thing, he never moved out of the ghetto, the hood. You ever think about that? Jesus grew up in Nazareth. 
He grew up in the hood. So don't give me that, oh, I grew the other side of the track. Oh, my parents on the, uh, I've been there the other side of the tracks. My parents were those same kind of parents on the other side of the track. But if we hold on to his promises and, and receive the nutrient and the truth and the healing and the direction of the word, that is life changing. It changes everything. Impossible for something to stay the same. When that word gives birth. So be encouraged, my brothers and my sisters, my sons and my daughters. I don't care what it is. Hold on to those promises that he has made you. See what he does. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.